So if you don't know uh, who I am, my name is Adam. Uh, I have a few aliases that I make music under. One is Iron Galaxy, that's kind of my own stuff. And then I do some stuff with my friend Anthony, a uh, solitary dancer. Um, and uh, through a lot of that work, I, I use this machine called the, the TB303. Um, it was this bassline machine that was, was meant to recreate uh, a bass guitar kind of for sing, singer-songwriters or just dudes in, in their in their basement trying to make tunes and they didn't have a friend that could play bass. So uh, they thought this machine could, could recreate that. Kind of after I show you the basics of the 303, I'll talk about how you can get all these guys to talk to each other and, and how kind of difficult or weird it was. Um, a lot of people hate programming this machine because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pain if you have a bass line in your head and you're trying to figure out uh, exactly how to recreate that but as sort of a creative inspirational machine, it's, it's really amazing. Um, the thing I think that, that people have a hard time getting their head around is the fact that you pick the notes and the timing separately. So uh, you'll, you'll enter uh, whatever scale you want and then you'll decide if you want rests and ties and all this kind of stuff afterwards. And we can kind of, we can do that and I'll try and hold it up so that you can see. Um, but basically, if we want to program a pattern <coughs> in this thing, we put it in pitch mode, um, and then this light comes on, and then we can start selecting notes. So we have, and I'll take the resonance down here so it's not so crazy, so we can kind of hear, hear the notes we have. So for me to restart that, I'm going to go normal and then back. So now I'm going to the beginning of my sequence. Um, and I just start tapping in notes on my keyboard. And you notice that some of, the, some of the tack switches on here are very sensitive, so you'll get double triggers and things that you didn't mean to do. But uh, like anything, uh, it's great to go with, with happy accidents and, and see where it takes you. So we can just kind of randomly pick some notes. Uh, if I'm playing live, sometimes I'll, I'll play live and program something uh, in real time and I'll just listen to, to what's playing, find the notes that are in key, play those, and then uh, we can go over to the timing mode and you have a few different options here. So you can create 16th notes, uh, you can create ties and you can create rests. So if I just hit the first 16th notes 16 times, then eventually the function light's gonna come on because I get to the end of the bar. You can only program one bar at a time and it's uh, gonna give me a 16th note pattern. So if I play that, right? So nonstop, it's, it's very repetitive and can be interesting, but uh, it's, it's not the most, it's not the greatest sequence we've ever heard. So if we go in there, we can decide uh, to tie things. So I'll just hit sort of the tie button all the way to the end and you'll see that we just get one, one solid note. So it's dropped in there, right? And if I decided that I wanted to create two tied notes, then I can go back into time and I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then do another note and then tie it. Three, four, five, six, seven, there we go. So now I should have two notes that are tied. And you notice that before I entered a, uh, a load of notes and they just get put in a buffer. So if we don't use all of those notes, then they you know, just kind of stay in that buffer. Um, so if I want to create rests, that's, that's pretty obvious. A rest will just have no notes. So if I hit rest the whole time, I'll get an empty pattern. So we can kind of do a combination of those things and, and just tap in here you know, without even thinking and go in there. And if we, like, if we like that sequence, but we don't like the notes, then what's cool is we can just go back to pitch and then go through those notes. And then I'm gonna hit normal and right, so it's, it's kept the same timing, but it's replaced the notes. So if I go into timing, it's gonna keep those notes. Very scientific. And <laughs> there. So that's our timing. Now, the other thing that kind of makes a 303 sequence or a 303 is the, the ties 
uh, and the accent. So the accent does a couple things, and you have a knob for it here. So when, when I turn the accent up, it's going to make the note louder. It's going to grab the filter a little bit more, so it's going to create more of a peak in the resonance. So, so you're going to hear it kind of screech, uh, and it's going it, to give it a lot more sort of oomph. Um, and we can add those things uh, by going back to the pitch mode. And you can do this to check what, what notes you have in your sequence. We use this button and it's going to step through everything. So as I, you can, you can hear what we played. So I'm going to go back to the beginning by going back between normal and pitch. And as I'm doing this, I can hold this button down and then I can hit accent. I can hit that, I can go slide. And then I also have transpose up and down. Now when I'm initially entering the notes, I can decide to hold down and press a button and it's going to pitch that particular note an octave down. I can do the same with the up and it will go octave up. Or I can do it at this point. Now when I do it here, you can't, you can't hear it actually pitching it up until we go back through and listen to it. So I'm just adding some slides, accents. And if we go back to the beginning, Here now that the ones that I've changed are, are updated. So if I go back into normal and then play my sequence, so cr cranking, cranking the accent, you can hear it really, really grabbing onto everything that's in there. So that's pattern right mode. Uh, if I go into play mode, then suddenly I have access to all of the patterns uh, that are here, and I have an A and a B section. So on here, I can create uh, eight patterns and then another eight patterns, mm -hmm. and I have, with this dial, uh, four different sections. So it actually is an eight-way selector switch, but uh, here we got one, two, three, and four. Actually, it's a seven-way selector switch. But if I go there or there, I'm still using the same 16 patterns in there. Uh, and I can write into any of them. So when I'm in write mode, if I want to write into pattern four, I go there, and then I do what I just showed you how to do. Um, if I want to read that uh, and play back in a scenario uh, where I want to go through a few different patterns, then I can put it in play mode, and then it shows me I'm on number four, and then I can click on the next one. And if I want to chain a few together, I can hold one, and grab the other, and it's going to sequentially go through them. And then it'll come back to the first one, which is, which is great if you, you know, create you know, a four-bar pattern and you want it to cycle round and round and round. But if you, say, decide to make one pattern, you want that to repeat three times, and you don't want to recreate it three times because, unfortunately, you can't copy and paste in this. And that was um, sort of an update that a lot of the new uh, clones did, and there's a company called Social Entropy that makes an update for this. So, so you actually use this 303, but you can install a MIDI kit and it replaces the CPU that's in it. So when you put the CPU in there, it'll give you functions like being able to, uh, you know, have the sequence go forward and backwards or copy into different places, go between read and write without stopping, um, which is something the 606 can do, but all of the other sort of XOX machines, like the 808 and that, you would have to stop your song and go between the two. Uh, so that's why a lot of people like to use the 606 Live, because they can play different patterns, they can jump around, they can you know, program it on the fly. This guy, you can't do that unless you have you know, something like I do, which I'm going to talk about at the end, or you have you know, something like the Social Entropy uh, Sequencer. I'm kind of scared to, to upgrade it, because I love the sound of this, and I don't want to mess with it. Um, but uh, I'm sure it would, would add a lot. They're going to make one for the 808 too, which looks really cool. Um, so uh, if you want to, say, play this pattern three times and then play this one and play this one and play this one, then that's where we get into the track writing mode. So if I go into uh, the track writing mode, then it's really complicated. I never use it. I tried it for the first time last night to, to show you. And I think the, the reason that this machine can frustrate people is because, you know, say in this case, I want to chain four patterns together. I have to go into that mode, set this to the beginning, if I'm remembering correctly. Then I have to start playing it. And actually, you can't do this while 
you're synced to something. So you have to unplug this machine. You have to then, so let's go back in there again. So I've got to go this button to go back to the beginning of, of my track sequence. Uh, I have to hit start. And it's going to start playing, you know, or whatever patch it's decided to be on. So while you're trying to think in your head which patterns you want, then it's going to start jumping around. So I hit that. I select that one. See, and it's just randomly jump to another one. I'm going to say I want to do pattern two again. Then maybe I'll do this pattern. And then I'm going to say, now this is the last pattern I'm going to put in. So I'm hit this button, and I'm going to do this pattern and write that last step. And then I'm going to stop it. So the whole time you're trying to program this thing, it's not actually going like, oh, I'll play the pattern that you want to be be putting in the sequence. It's just confusing the hell out of you, or at least it is for me. Um, so then I have to go into write mode, hit this, then play, and and then it should play this one twice now, I think we programmed. And then I think we jumped over here, and then we did our last one over here. And then it's going to come back to the beginning. So it's doable, but it's, it's kind of a pain. So uh, I'll sync it up with my computer, program a bunch of uh, patterns in it, and I'll hang out on one for a bit in read mode, record it, maybe jump to another one. And then once I have it on the computer, then you can edit it and, and play around. Though, you know, if you're trying to tweak the knobs and the sound and do all that at the same time, then it's a bit of a pain. So it might be worth learning, learning how to do that. And it's not that hard, but the manual is, is like reading the most cryptic piece of writing you've ever come across. Uh, like, I, I thought I have a pretty good handle on this machine, but it, it took me a little while. I, and I had to end up watching a video of some guy. Uh, so YouTube is your friend. Um, so that's kind of the basics of, of sequencing it. So you have, uh, we can do that seven times. So that's why I have my seven, seven point selector switch. Now each one of them will be a different song or a different track. So uh, if I wanted to program, you know, a part of the song where there was nothing happening, then I would just program a pattern that had all rests and nothing was happening. And we could jump to that. Um, so. That's how we write it. Now, at the very top, we have a bunch of functions that actually make it sound interesting. Um, so I'm just going to plug this guy back in so that we can, we can sync with things. Um, so if I hit play on this, um, then I've got the cutoff of my, maybe I'll turn it up a little bit. Ah. And we're in, in track uh, play mode, so we'll go back to sort of pattern right, so we just stay on one pattern. So we'll do this first and then we're on. So, so we've got the cutoff. So if I go all the way counterclockwise, it's our low pass filter. So we'll lose a lot of the high end. Uh, we have a lot of punch right now because we have that accent. So if I bring those accents all the way down, it's as if I programmed it without any accents. Um, the resonance is adding kind of a bump just before the, the cutoff, so you're rolling off all the high end. But just before you do that, you're, you're giving a boost to, to uh, just before you're, you're cutting. So if I crank this, then that's kind of what gives it that really squelchy sound that we, the 303 is really, really known for. Um, the envelope mod will kind of make it grab a little bit, so it's going to snap down, uh, kind of in the same way. Uh, if you, you know, if you've ever used something like a 101, uh, and you apply a envelope generator to a filter, so you have ADSR. Um, the more you apply that to that, then it can it can snap depending on how you've set your attack, decay, sustain, release. So this just has a built-in. Uh, envelope, and then you're just sort of giving more to that, and that's going to bite more on things that are accented, and it's going to start doing things that you, you may recognize. The decay is just going to shorten the notes, right? So that's the only part of that ADSR that you have access to. Um, so you can, you know, you can get really sort of punchy small sounds, and you can stretch those out. You know, so if you're doing if you're doing slides and that sort of stuff, then um, you can almost hide notes if you if you put a bunch of slides in your in your pattern, uh, and you'll only get those notes that that you've sort of programmed uh, a sixteenth note in, and then you can reveal those by 
pulling out the, the, the decay and opening up the filter, and then you start to get the slidiness. So sometimes I listen to a track that has a 303 pattern, and I think it's a few that are layered, and it's just kind of the, the magic of, of the machine. Um, you have two different waveforms that you can select. Usually mine stays on the square wave. Um, you also have a sawtooth, so I can kind of flip between those. This one. You'll hear it has like a bit more bite, so I don't know if you're listening to like hard floor records from the, the 90s, that's, I think they tended to stick on, on the sawtooth. Uh, and then if I flip over to the square wave, it's just like a little bit softer. Uh, I feel it's like a little bit less cheesy. A lot of those records that were using the, the sawtooth, they would add a lot of distortion. And a lot of the, the producers uh, who were making music, I mean, up till today, but especially in the 90s, a lot of those guys were using Mackie mixers, not unlike this. Uh, and they would crank uh, the input um, and then bring the fader down a bit to kind of get some distortion. So. I don't know how well this is going to do it, but... So you kind of get that. And if we go over... It's kind of got that grindy thing. Uh, so we can lay off it. You know, we could we could distort into pedals and, and various things. And there's tons of shootout, shootouts on the internet where people are like, I love the rat pedal and I love this distortion and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's uh, that's sort of the the basics and and what you need to know to get this making the sounds that you you probably recognize. Now, if you want to incorporate it into the gear that you have. Um, then you, you need a few extra items. Um, so if you just bought this and you had a computer, then you could just sit there and kind of you know, DJ with it a little bit and get it close to the tempo that you want, record it into Ableton and, and, or Logic or whatever you use and move the audio around so that uh, it fits on the timeline. The, the best way to, to lock it up, I found, is this uh, device called the, the Acme SND. Uh, there's a few people who make something similar. Um, just to get it in, in sync with, uh, with your current setup, you need to use what's called DINSYNC, so DINSYNC 24. So a lot of these machines, like the 808 takes DINSYNC, this takes DINSYNC, um, your 707, does it take both? I think it takes MIDI and DINSYNC, yeah. Um, the 909 also has uh, either or. Um, so something like the 808, you can either have it slave to DIN sync, or you can have it send the sync signal out. So if you had an 808 in this, then you could get going. So if you were ever, uh, you know, if you ever looked at the live setup of, of like a band like LFO or something like that, you know, they had maybe an 808 being the master, and then that was syncing, and they were splitting the DIN sync signals off to other things. Um, you can use what's called, well, Kenton makes a, a, a MIDI to DIN sync converter, and there's a, a bunch of companies that make uh, these things. And, and basically, you can send MIDI from your computer, either via USB, if it has that. The, the MIDI to DIN sync converter I have, you just plug MIDI into it, so I would have to use a MIDI interface, plug into that, and then that sends sync onto this. And, and basically, it's just sending 24 pulses per quarter note to whatever device you're, you're plugging it into. So it's, it's waiting for these, these ticks to, to, it's kind of like a conductor keeping everything in time. Um, the device that I have allows us to uh, send out, uh, it sends out that clock. So on here, you have a few different outputs. Um, so the first two will have MIDI and in sync, and then the last two just have two MIDI ports. Um, and basically, on here I have the, the, the 303 on here and the 808 on here, and the, whoop, the computer is sending uh, this click signal. So you can kind of see in, in Ableton, it's just like constantly giving this, uh, giving this sound. And if I actually put it out there, you can listen to what it's, what it's doing. So. so it's just coming out of my computer, that's going into this device. Um, and what that does is it, it, it tells 
this device what the tempo is of the song. So if I move the tempo, it's going to speed it up. It's just a little plug-in, and you can get an audio file that does the exact same thing. Um, and the reason that we use audio to try and sync this thing is because Ableton never goes, oh, I'm going to take audio track number one and kind of put it out of time with audio track four. Uh, they always stay locked, no matter what. Whereas computers uh, and the, the design of, of uh, sort of MIDI clock, the, I guess there's not been much care put into to how it's implemented, or people just don't care about it so much. So it's really easy to, to kind of get messed up on the computer. So uh, you'll find if you add plugins, suddenly there's like a delay. So maybe your 303 was synced very perfectly, and then suddenly your project was heavier, and then they start separating in time, and you're like, what's, what's going on? And, and for those of you who've used Ableton and have tried to sync things, you know that you can go in there and you can adjust this latency. So you can say, actually, like, give it the clock a little bit earlier because it's out of time now. So you're constantly having to go in there and, and, and adjust this time. Now, because audio never goes out of time with audio, if you send this click to this, then this can generate the sync. And it can generate MIDI, it can generate it to Sync 24, it can be used as a MIDI interface, uh, and all kinds of things. Um, so what's cool about this is you have four separate streams. So I can decide to turn on my 303. Uh, oh, and the reason it's not working is because I just showed you the click, and it's not going to it's not going to the machine. So I got to send it back to one. So basically, I have a sound card that's sending channel one to here, and then I sent channel two to here just so that you could hear that silly click. Um, so now this should be getting that, and it, there we go. Um, and because it's on here, and I have my 808 set to this one, I can drop the 808 in separately, and that problem of having to go between read and write, so if I'm performing live, then I can stop the 303 at a point, and you know maybe Francis is playing the ARP or, and doing something else, and I'm getting ready to program a bass line for the next song. Then I can throw this into write mode, program a pattern really quickly, kind of listen to what's playing, you know, get it in key, and then I can come back in and say, okay, I'm about to, to drop the 303 back in there, and then I have my new pattern. Um, so it lets me jump, jump between those things. It, it can allow me to do things like double the tempo, which sounds really ridiculous with a 303. Halving the tempo is kind of cool. Right? Um, and then I can go back to normal. Um, I also have the ability to swing any of these things. So if we listen to just the, the 808 and the hi-hats, if I turn this guy up, it's a bit extreme at the moment, but you can see that now a device that doesn't have swing on it I can, I can give it swing because it's bending that clock. So, so what it's doing is, is this is trying to get that 24 pulses per quarter note, and now that's kind of being swung. So all, all it's doing is, is advancing notes and steps when it gets that information. So if it can bend that information in the right way, then suddenly you can get a lot more out of these machines than they were originally designed for. So, you know, the, the drum machine that came after this was the 909, and they had uh, internal swing that people love, and it's sort of revered for, and it's the sound of it. And a lot of people used that on records because it had the ability to, whereas, you know, this was, you know, doing a lot of straight kind of, you know, like electro music and really straight hi-hats. There was no swing because nobody could swing it at the time. But in the last few years, people have been designing these, these devices. Uh, there's another one. When, when I got this when the ERM multi-clock wasn't out, and that does basically the same thing and is, what, about half the price, I think? Um, I love this thing. It was like kind of a real boring purchase, but it did a lot of things that I needed it to do. Uh, and playing live, it just gave me the, the confidence that things weren't going to fall apart. And uh, Fr Francis, I keep referring to Francis because he plays live with me when, when we play as Iron Galaxy. Um, and we played Mutech uh, this past year, and probably about 
five minutes into the set, the sound guy came up and said, oh, your output is scratchy, something's going on. So we were messing with the cables, wasn't fixing it. So in all my wisdom, I decided to pick up the mixer and just drop it. So I figured that would like shake whatever's loose. And it worked, but at the same time, all of these things were on the same table. So the, the 909 went and like kind of slammed up and down when I did that. And it would just freaked out and was like, I don't know what time it is anymore. So suddenly you were just hearing hi-hats from it and the hi-hats are like clanging and, and going crazy. So I was able to just turn it off, bring it back in one bar later and then psh, it locked up. And in any other situation, we would have to like delay everything out, stop the whole clock, which was at, you know, in that live set would have been Ableton. So Ableton was, was basically just being the, the conductor for, for all of the machines. Um, but that's how we would have had to do that. And we've had friends who play just using the computer syncing machines and they've had to come up with all these sort of um, tricks for the inevitable you know, sync loss where everything goes all over the place. And I've had I've, Jacques Green, who you're going to see lecture in a few days, I remember saying like, oh, I like how you switched up the bass line on the 303 at this one part. You like kind of shifted where it was. And he was like, uh, it went out of time. And I unplugged it and tried to like plug it in at the beginning of the bar so that it would, would get to it. And it was a little bit late and it was kind of funky, but it was a, a cool moment. So, but I'd, I'd rather be safe than have those those cool moments. But you can, you can kind of engineer those cool moments with this because um, beyond just swinging, you can shift uh, the clock of something. So if I'm playing the 808 and the 303 together, we've been hearing this pattern kind of getting boring. Uh, and sometimes just shifting where the, the beginning note starts will make it a lot more interesting. So I can shift by 16ths by turning this knob. I go a little bit further. Oh, okay. I, I flipped my two shifts. So this one's a fine shift. So if you find like something is just a little bit ahead or just a little bit behind, then you can push it forward or pull it back in very small increments. And then this is the one that does 16th notes. So if I... And it might make a bit more sense if we go in here and put maybe a snare drum. So let's see. So between that kind of stuff and then... That's a bit silly when you do it. It almost sounds like it kind of rewinds itself. So if I'm, if I'm here, we'll let it kind of catch up. It kind of freaks out for a second and then gets in its groove. So going forward is kind of cool. If you're going back, you might want to like bring the audio down, reshift where your sequence is, and then do that. Now. If I just had like a Kenton MIDI kit uh, syncing this guy and I did really fast movements in tempo in the song, it would probably kind of freak out and separate it and it would suddenly be out of time. And this is pretty good. I can just grab the tempo. So I'm pulling the tempo, you know, way down or wherever I want to put it and I can kind of skip around. So that's, that's kind of the basics of, of how sync works and this. And there's a lot of different solutions to, to have sort of safe, solid clock. And the, the beauty of this machine is that I plug it in, I don't have to think about it, uh, and it just, it just works. I'm never having to go in and play with latency. I have the creativity to be able to kind of flip and audition things without recording it and shifting it in 16ths in, in the computer. And you kind of get everything right in front of you. Um, another thing that it solved for me is if you've ever used an SP-1200, the swing on that machine is on eighth notes, which is ridiculous for whatever reason. So you always have to, what a lot of the hip hop guys would do is double the tempo. 
Uh, and uh, so if they were making something that was 90 BPM, they'd make it 180, and then uh, they would add swing to it, and then it would swing on the 16th. On here, you can just double the tempo this way. So if you've started a song, and you say, oh, I'd really love to use the swing of the MPC because it's kind of a, you know, got a vibe, then you can easily do that without having to like double the tempo of your song and you, you've already recorded parts that are 120 BPM or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of, uh, of how all that works. Um, did you guys have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's hard because you're 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 separating the timing with the notes. So um, you can count it out, but sometimes you you kind of double double click some some switches. So uh, you know if I'm going in here, then I just have to count that I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, and then when I hit 16, it should drop over here, right? So I was pretty good at hitting that button, and the button seemed to be pretty clean. A lot of times these will double trigger. What you, what you can do also is if you don't want a pattern that's just 16 notes, then we can say, I only want this pattern to be a five, five step sequence or something like that. Um, so. What I can do when I'm in here is I can hold down this bar mode and I press step. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, then I can go back in here. So if I go in timing mode, it should be one, two, three, four, five, and then it, it pops in here. So I can hit play on this. And we should have something. That's how you get kind of those cycling patterns, right? So that's how you would you would do that. Now you can you can check the timing. So in the same way that I clicked the pitch mode and I stepped through everything and saw what I was doing, um, I can go to the timing mode and it's gonna flash these two lights. So it's gonna tell me what I hit on each step. So on this particular pattern, I just did all 16th notes. So as I stepped through my timing mode, it just went one, two, three, four, five. And for those who couldn't see, it's just this light keeps going. So if I go in here and I kind of go back and forth, then when I step through the timing mode, I can see, oh, okay, I did a tie there, et cetera, and then it pops, pops into place. Um, so those are the ways of going back and reviewing what you've done. Now, in, in the pitch mode, I can go and I can correct uh, certain things like whether it's pitched up or down, whether I'm adding accents or slides and that sort of stuff. Uh, but in timing mode, if I see what I have and I go, oh, it's wrong, I have to go back to the beginning and just program in what I want. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the basics of it. But it is a bit uh, difficult if you're trying to program something very, very particular. Uh, if you just kind of want to come up with some interesting patterns, then it's kind of fun to, to, to flip around. Um, yeah. Any other, uh, any other questions about? Ah, um, so I, I kept my Zox box. I actually bought the Zox box before I bought the 303 because I thought I would never be able to afford the 303. Um, and I actually ended up paying more for this than, than this because there was a guy selling his entire record collection. He sold off all his gear. Um, and actually a, a student of mine had gone to buy his 707 and he bought it for the going rate. He told me, oh, he, the guy's got a 303 too. I'm like, well, why don't you f find out what he wants for it? But I you know, didn't think to pursue it because I figure if he's asking the, the market price for a 707, he's going to do the same for this. And we just happened to go to buy that guy's record collection, uh, had lots of like 80s Italo disco stuff, and it was just sitting there. And I was like, oh, you make music. Uh, and uh, he's like, oh, I used to. I sold everything off. Uh, I'm like, well, what are you going to do with the 303? You hanging on to that because you love it? And he's like, oh, well, it's broken, so there's no point, you know. Uh, so he you know, I was like, are you going to sell it? Like, he's like, yeah, but you don't want it. It's broken. I'm like, well, what, what would you want for it? It's like, I don't know, two, three hundred bucks. You know, and this was only a couple of years ago. So I was like, I can go to the bank machine if you want two hundred bucks for it. And when I came back from the bank machine, he was like, oh, I found the original case and the box and everything. So uh, 
Yes, I thank him, and it's been getting a lot of use, and it's <laughs> so it's not just sitting up in some, you know, behind glass. Uh, what so, was uh, somebody had plugged in like a power supply that wasn't meant for it, so it got too much voltage, and it blew something early on in the power supply. So I brought it to to a tech, and he just replaced one part, and. We were good, good to go. It was like 20 bucks. So, uh, so yeah. So, anyways, my long story, all to say, um, it's it's hard to put in in words. I, I feel like this is a bit sort of thicker and a bit grindier. I feel like between the different 303s, they're all going to have a different uh, sound to them. Uh, so, no two 303s are alike. They're going on what, like 30 three years old now or something like that. So parts have been changed in some of them. You know, some of them have aged differently. Some of them have been taken care of better than others. Um, so inevitably, they're going to sound different. They're you know, probably calibrated slightly differently. Um, you know, the parts that they tried to source for this, they couldn't get all of the original parts, but they tried to get sort of modern versions of whatever it was. But you know, with a lot of these analog synths, they're not. Uh, you know they're not complicated machines. Uh, so, you know if you try if you bought like a new Access virus or some digital machine and something goes in it, well you don't have the schematics. You can't. You don't know what's going on, and they're not going to give you that information. So um, it's very hard to fix something when it's when it's broken. A lot of these machines you can find the schematics online. There are people who have been dedicated to fixing these things and repairing these things forever, and a lot of the parts are available or they're uh, sort of newer versions of those parts that, that work in the machines. The only stuff that, you know, on this machine, the only thing that would be difficult is if the CPU blew and it was broken and you didn't have the sequencer anymore. But even nowadays, because this is such a popular machine, there's people like Social Entropy that create this new version of the CPU so it could add all this functionality. So if I bought one with a dead computer in it, then I'll just you know, it would cost me a couple hundred bucks, but I could buy the MIDI kit and the upgrade from them for 300 bucks or whatever it goes for. Don't quote me on that, but it's around there. Uh, and just pop the chip in there, and then it should should be good as new. Um, yeah, so I, I kept this because of all the extra functions. Um, I Some of you have used the Circlon that's upstairs. Uh, it's really great to MIDI sequence things with and, and, and get really different style sequences. So I love sequencing this guy with that. And if this had a MIDI kit, I would probably do that too, but I didn't want to hack it up. And honestly, for the prices that these go for, it's almost not worth selling it and then buying the MIDI kit for this. I'm going to end up even or maybe even spending more to do that. Um, this is useful too because you can use it as a converter box. So on the back you've got you've got DIN sync, which is what we talked about earlier that syncs these. You also have uh, MIDI in, out, and through. Uh, you know, so you can play it from you know your piano roll and whatever sequencer uh, you're using. Um, you can sync it via MIDI. You can sync it via DIN. Uh, you can sync it via. Uh, I don't know if you can sync it via USB. I've never tried, uh, but it has USB. It might be just to uh, kind of upgrade the operating system. Because because the operating system on this is open source, there's a variety of functions that are available depending on whose version you put in there. So some people have really tried to get as much as they can out of the limited space on the, on the, the chip that's in there and design new functions and get rid of other functions uh, to make room for it. Uh, I find that this one is just a lot more grindy and growly. Uh, I hear a big difference. I don't like one over the other. But I love the sequencer in this. This is like the big draw for me. Is is uh, there's there's other ones that kind of look like this. You may have seen the TT Bass bot. Uh, I know Quattro A from the first term brought his down, and I was teaching him how to use this, and he was saying it was slightly different the way you program. But um, but maybe there's a way, and both of us just didn't know how to how to sequ sequence it in the same way. But I just love this functionality of like. Enter your notes, enter your timing, come up with something. If you don't like the timing of it, then change the timing really quick. Like, you know, I can go in here and write a pattern in, in two seconds. So if I go in pitch mode, I can, you know, hit a bunch of things and I go in here and, blah, you know, I've got something. It might not sound pretty, but pretty funky. I don't know. You know? <laughs> so 
it, if I program something on here with the internal sequencer, then I'm like, step one, this, step two, that, step three, that. And maybe somebody has upgraded the operating system not to do that. And honestly, once I got that, then I didn't, I only worried about using this as a box that accepts MIDI. Um, so hopefully there's nobody on the internet saying, well, wow, you, can, you can do that with this already. Um, <laughs> maybe you can, maybe you can't. But uh, yeah, I just love the way this works and it has a particular sound to it. Uh, you know, when you get the really sort of resonant, bubbly stuff, I find that this doesn't really get there and this totally gets in that zone. And I love that because there's so many records that I listen to that, that have that sound. And I, I think that's, you know, part of the sound is it's on so many great records and there's some nostalgia behind it. And uh, I don't know. So it's, you know, I, I bought this and I was always like, one, one day I'd love, love to get that. And I think a week later we visited that guy's record collection and, and now it's, it's been in my possession for a while and, and I would never get rid of it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so, so when we play live, we have uh, a mixing desk, usually a 24-channel mixing desk, uh, sometimes a Midas, often a, an Allen & Heath, like the GL 2200, 2400 series that are really practical boards that uh, if you go to any live venue where they're, you know, people are playing guitars and that kind of stuff, usually the sound guy is on one of those. Um, and on each channel, you can pre-fade or listen. So just like you're DJing, you can have a pair of headphones on and say, bring the fader down, hit the PFL button on that one, and you can hear it come up. So I can kind of put one ear on and be like, okay, what's, what's playing out there? Let's find the notes. Great, program my sequence, listen to it. Does it sound kind of cool with everything else? And if it's good, then just bring the fader up. So I'll often do that with the 303. I always do that with the 101. That's one of my favorite sequencers too. It's really, really simple. Uh, and uh, you know, if you guys want, we can do a little session on, on that as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a great way to improvise in a, in a world where, you know, it's sometimes difficult to do that. You know, you're kind of restrained by the parts that you have or the computer program you're using. Um, so bringing these machines out, I feel like adds a vibe. People see and they kind of know what's going on when you're tweaking the, that and they see you doing something and suddenly there's a baseline done when you bring the fader up. So, um, even if they don't exactly know what you're up to, uh, yeah, it adds a little bit more. And it's more exciting for, for us to play live and actually have stuff that's live. You know, it's something, even if the computer is playing it and it's kind of safely in time and we're not worried about like messing up if we don't have keyboard chops, uh, it's still, you know, a new dimension to the song. And there's been times where we play live and I wish I still had that sequence on the 101 because it was really great and trying to go back and create that moment is difficult, but that's kind of what makes it interesting. It's like, you know, fleeting. 